I recall that we were looking at uh, the case of one dimensional motion in a nonlinear oscillator situation where the Hamiltonian the function of q and p was something of the form p squared over 2 plus q to the 2r over 2r where r is a positive integer and the case r equal to 1 corresponded to the simple harmonic oscillator. We had computed what the action was for motion in this potential and we discovered that the action which was an integral over p dq for bounded motion oscillatory motion in this potential was proportional to a certain power of the energy of the oscillator itself which is e to the power r plus 1 over 2r this is the result we obtained. Of course if you translate this back to action angle variables the way we had defined it earlier this implies that k the Hamiltonian as a function of the action is proportional to the action to the power 2r over r plus 1 which immediately implies that the frequency omega of motion which is defined as delta k over delta i is proportional to i to the power r minus 1 over r plus 1. If you therefore define a degree of nonlinearity alpha say and that is defined as delta log i over delta log omega then this is equal to r minus 1 over r plus 1 and notice that r equal to 1 which is the simple harmonic oscillator alpha is 0 no nonlinearity and as r becomes larger and larger the nonlinearity tends as r tends to infinity to the value unity. So it is a very useful indicator of the degree of nonlinearity if you like of uh, an oscillator of this kind not a universal measure of any uh, by any means not a universal measure or anything like that but a very useful one in many contexts okay. We also saw that the semi classical quantization of this system is immediate it follows at once because if you recall in semi classical quantum mechanics semi classical quantization corresponds to writing i which is integral p d q equal to n times Planck's constant where this is an integer and if you take that along with this this at once implies that n is proportional to the energy level e sub n to the power r plus 1 by 2r or e n is proportional to n to the power 2r over r plus 1. So it tells you something about the level spacing for quantized motion in this potential is it the other way about Pardon? ah yes of course this is log omega over log i and that is this degree of nonlinearity okay the way the frequency changes as a function of the action thank you. So semi classically we find that the energy level the nth energy level is dependent on the quantum number n in this one dimensional problem according to this relation here valid for n much much bigger than unity which is where the semi classical rule is valid and again you notice that when r is equal to 1 so here r equal to 1 which is simple harmonic oscillations we know that e n is proportional to n itself that is a level spacing which is equi spaced equally spaced energy levels and this is exactly what the harmonic oscillator does in quantum mechanics 
of course the exact relation for E n is n plus half times h cross omega and the half arises from so called zero point motion it is the ground represents the ground state energy of the oscillator but we are not going to get into quantum mechanics here just to point out that this semi classical argument is immediately uh, immediately leads to this result that E n is proportional to this power of n for this whole family of potentials notice also that as r tends to infinity we end up with E n going like n squared and that is precisely the level spacing for a potential which rises more and more steeply infinitely steeply namely a particle in a box. So this is exactly the same as the level spacing for a particle in a box in a one dimensional box. So that limit too is correctly obtained from this semi classical formula one can go further and actually try to find the correction to this n corrections to other uh, this quantity here etc but we are not going to get into that right now. So so much for a little digression on semi classical quantization uh, which follows from the arguments we have been giving here. Now let us go back a few steps and ask what is the reason for having integrability in a Hamiltonian system. So we go back to n degrees of freedom n freedom integrable Hamiltonian and ask what is the underlying physical reason for the existence of n constants of the motion f1 through fn in involution with each other yes. 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 The way we've talked about it so far is a Hamiltonian system. The phase space variables come in pairs. So we identify n degrees of freedom, n independent degrees of freedom, which means that you must specify n numbers q1 through qn for me to tell me completely the configuration of the system in real space. So like. And in addition you need n conjugate momenta to complete the description of the system in phase space in other words to describe the dynamics of the system. So I call number of degrees of freedom the same as the number of generalized coordinates that I have number of independent degrees of freedom. In the case of more general dynamical systems first of all the phase space does not have to be even dimensional this pairwise structure the Poisson bracket structure is not necessary at all. And I do not distinguish between different kinds of variables I just call the whole set dynamical variables 1 to n or as many as there are yeah. yes 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 absolutely yes absolutely it is the same it is the same as the degrees of freedom if I give you for instance in statistical mechanics when you discuss monatomic gases diatomic gases and so on for a diatomic gas you ask how many degrees of freedom does a diatomic but molecule have chaotic motion, right? it's not some chaotic yes so, yes so there's no concept of degrees of freedom. ah the question is whether in chaotic motion the concept of degrees of freedom appears or not of course it does it has absolutely nothing to do with the kind of motion identification of the number of degrees of freedom yes I would believe so I would believe so unless there are other reasons to believe that external forces are present or there is a time dependent perturbation acting on the system or anything like that. But if I give you a collection of molecules and you assume Newtonian mechanics to hold good and the system is isolated they act with forces acting upon each other caused by themselves then I do not see why it is not a Hamiltonian system. Why do you say I cannot formulate the system? I assume let us assume put a model on it let us assume that Newton's equations are valid let us assume that there is a certain potential energy between two molecules a certain distance apart once I have a model of that kind I have a Hamiltonian system with a very large number of degrees of freedom no doubt the motion is in general chaotic it is very irregular it is not integrable yes it is assumed to be Hamiltonian yes indeed of course in real gases you have many other complications for instance you might have to bring in quantum mechanics you might have to so solve the entire problem quantum mechanically 
that is a separate subject in itself we are not going to get into that here, but otherwise yes it is a Hamiltonian system. The kind of motion that a system has whether it is regular or integrable or ergodic or chaotic this has nothing to do with the identification of the number of degrees of freedom that you have absolutely nothing to do with it. So, let us look at an n freedom Hamiltonian system for which the Liouville Arnold criterion tells us that the system is integrable if you have n constants of the motion f1 to fn in involution. And then we saw that a transformation to action angle variables is possible and once you make this transformation the Hamiltonian becomes independent of the angle variables it is a function of the action variables alone and then you can integrate the entire 2n set of equations that you have all 2n equations for prescribed initial conditions at least in principle you can do this. Now you could ask what is the physical reason why this system is integrable why these systems are integrable what is the physical significance of these f1 through fn. Of course the action variables which we talked about which lead to the natural frequencies of the system the omega i are certain combinations of these f's. So in that sense there is already some physical interpretation for these f's, but can we think of this in a slightly more physical fashion is there something much more immediate and the answer is yes the existence of these constants of the motion is related to some hidden symmetry in the problem a certain dynamical symmetry in the problem. For instance if I looked at two harmonic oscillators and the spring constants are the same in the two perpendicular directions then you would immediately tell me that the Hamiltonian is rotationally invariant you make any rotation in the x y plane and the Hamiltonian does not change at all. So there is a certain symmetry in the problem and the existence of symmetry is linked to integrability. So whenever a system is integrable whenever you have these constants of the motion there exists a certain dynamical symmetry in the problem. Now let us try to understand what this dynamical symmetry is at least go a little bit into this it is a vast subject by itself but let me at least give the rudiments of this subject. Let us go back and ask what does a canonical transformation actually do to a system. So we start with a system with variables q p and you make a canonical transformation to a new set of variables capital Q and P. What does this do what kind of transformation is it or if you like if these Q's and P's are combined into a phase space variable x a 2n dimensional vector then these could similarly be combined into a 2n dimensional vector xi these quantities are functions of these quantities which preserve the Poisson bracket structure. In other words we know that q i q j is equal to p i p j is equal to 0 and we know that q i p j is equal to delta i j. Now what is meant by a statement like this what is meant for example by this statement here what I mean by this is this implies if I write out this Poisson bracket explicitly it implies that a summation from k equal to 1 to n over all degrees of freedom delta q i over delta q k delta p i p j over delta p k minus delta q i over delta p k delta p j over delta q k this quantity is equal to the delta function that is the definition of the Poisson bracket in the original coordinates and if the Poisson bracket structure is preserved it means you have a relation of this kind for every value of i and j similarly we could write these down as well. Now is it possible to use this matrix j which we had introduced and write this in simpler form well yes indeed because you already know that I can write any Poisson bracket I could write any Poisson bracket in more compact form if I use the J matrix what would that be it would say take this quantity q i and take its derivatives take the transpose of this construct it into a row vector put the J in between and then the column vector from the derivatives of this 
and that would be equal to delta i j okay. So can we combine all these three relations into a single relation and the answer is yes not surprisingly it turns out that all these relations can be combined let me do that here this whole set of relations is equivalent to saying that the Jacobian matrix of the transformation which let me denote symbolically as delta xi over this delta x by the way this stands for the matrix delta q p over delta q p this matrix transpose j times delta xi over delta x this quantity is equal to j itself it is easy to check that all these relations are summarized in the single line by this equation this matrix equation it is not very difficult to verify that this is so I have used this symbolically just to tell us immediately that it is just the Jacobian matrix corresponding to the canonical transformation now what does this tell us this quantity is a 2n by 2n matrix its transpose with a j in between times the matrix must be equal to j itself the same matrix j and recall that this j was equal to 0 the unit n by n matrix minus that and 0 it was a 2n by 2n matrix of this kind what would you call a matrix such that its transpose times the matrix itself is equal to the unit matrix what do you call a matrix which obeys this condition matrix transpose times the matrix square matrix equal to i itself well if it is real then it is an orthogonal matrix this is the definition of an orthogonal matrix the inverse of the matrix is equal to its transpose that is an orthogonal matrix if the matrix is restricted to real entries then of course a unitary matrix is an orthogonal matrix because there is nothing to complex conjugate but in general the matrix could have complex elements in our cases here all these are real variables therefore we do not have any complex elements so a matrix of this kind is an orthogonal matrix can you give me an example of a transformation of coordinates say which is represented by an orthogonal matrix every rotation absolutely right every rotation in physical space is an ortho represented by an orthogonal matrix in three dimensional Euclidean space any three by three orthogonal matrix of unit determinant represents a physical rotation of the coordinate system and the simplest of these of course as you are well aware is if you took the x y axis and you went off to x prime and y prime at an angle alpha then this rotation in the x y plane about the origin is represented by a 2 by 2 orthogonal matrix whose structure is is what what is the matrix representing this rotation absolutely it is just cos alpha sin alpha minus sin alpha cos alpha and so on in three dimensions you can generalize this to higher dimensions so orthogonal matrices with unit determinant with determinant plus one represent physical rotations okay. that matrix there which represents a canonical transformation in the 2n dimensional phase space is not orthogonal because there is a j sitting here and a j sitting there but by now we have got used to this j appearing everywhere in Hamiltonian dynamics this is pseudo orthogonal in a certain sense such a matrix is called a symplectic matrix let me write that down a matrix m transpose j m equal to j so this is some where m is a 2n by 2n matrix is called a symplectic matrix 
So what is the lesson we learned from that equation there? Canonical transformations are represented by symplectic matrices just as rotations are represented by orthogonal matrices of unit determinant canonical transformations are represented by symplectic matrices. Therefore in exactly the same way that the study of orthogonal matrices tells you everything you need to know about rotations in exactly the same way the study of symplectic matrices tells you everything you need to know about canonical transformations. So this is an algebraic approach to the study of canonical transformations. Now this kind of equation has remarkable properties as we will see in a second. The first of which is the following if I took the determinant on both sides what is the determinant of J? J was defined by that matrix the determinant of J is plus 1 we check this out so determinant J plus 1 and it turns out from this equation it follows if I took the determinant of the left hand side the determinant of a product of matrices is just the product of determinants and the determinant of M transpose is the same as the determinant of M. So this tells you at once that this implies that determinant M is equal to plus or minus 1 because the square is equal to 1. It turns out that you can show without too much difficulty although it is a non trivial exercise that the determinant of a symplectic matrix is in fact plus 1. This is why I mentioned earlier that canonical transformations also preserve orientation they do not just preserve they preserve a number of things among other things they preserve orientation but this is reflected in the fact that the determinant of a symplectic matrix is plus 1. Just as orthogonal matrices form a group the product of two orthogonal matrices is also an orthogonal matrix every orthogonal matrix has an inverse and they form a group in exactly the same way the symplectic matrices of a given order form a group of matrices. This is a subgroup of the set of all 2n by 2n matrices which are non singular so let me write that down the group of all 2n by 2n real matrices so we are restricting ourselves to matrices which are real with real entries 2n by 2n non singular what is a non singular matrix the determinant is not equal to 0 in other words there is an inverse for the matrix. So the group of all 2n by 2n non singular real matrices is denoted by GL the general linear group of order 2n over the reals so this stands for the general linear among such matrices the symplectic matrices form a subgroup of such matrices in other words the product of two symplectic matrices is again a symplectic matrix all 2n by 2n for a given order okay. so it is a subgroup of this thing here and this group is called the symplectic group and it is denoted by sp 2n and it is a subgroup of GL to n. Therefore for a given dynamical system with a given number of degrees of freedom n the study of its canonical transformations amounts to the study of the symplectic group of the same order of order 2n. 
Now a great deal is known about the properties of such matrices. So a great deal is known about the symplectic group and what it implies and what its generators are and so on and so forth. Therefore we have a fairly good idea of what the symmetry possessed by a system should be a Hamiltonian system should be under a canonical transformation a Hamiltonian flow goes to a Hamiltonian flow measure is preserved. What do you need for a symmetry of the system though? What do I mean by the dynamical symmetry of a system? What would you say is given a dynamical system what would you say is a dynamical symmetry of the system? One possibility is to look at its Hamiltonian if it is a Hamiltonian system and ask what kind of transformations leaves the Hamiltonian unchanged that is one possibility. But of course in the case of a Hamiltonian system you need more than that you actually must make sure that the transformations of coordinates of the variables is also canonical so that the structure of Hamilton's equations is unchanged. The most general way of defining what the dynamical symmetry group of a dynamical system is is to say a set of a transformation which leaves the solutions unchanged maybe takes one solution to another and it mixes up different solutions but the solution space the set of solutions of the dynamical equations should remain unchanged that is what I would call a dynamical symmetry of a system. The full set of solutions must remain of the dynamical equations must remain unchanged. If I accept that then it is easy to see what I mean by the dynamical symmetry group of a Hamiltonian system and let us write that down. this I mean the dynamical symmetry group of a system is a set of transformations of its phase space variables. set of transformations that leave the solution space pardon me that is uh, sorry I did not get the question uh, what is F no not necessarily not necessarily there is nothing to do with the Hamiltonian system right now we are talking about a very general statement I am simply saying when I have a dynamical system described by a set of differential equations and I ask what is meant by a symmetry group of the system the most obvious statement is that it is a set of change of variables of the system such that the solutions do not get changed the set of solutions does not get changed that is what I would mean by dynamical symmetry group. Now let us come to a Hamiltonian system and ask what is the dynamical symmetry group of a Hamiltonian system what can it possibly be well what do you need for a Hamiltonian systems solutions to remain unchanged first of all I certainly need the following I certainly need the Hamiltonian system the Hamiltonian flow to go to a Hamiltonian flow I certainly need that this is done by the set of canonical transformations <coughs> but I need more than that I would like to leave the solution space unchanged in other words the Hamiltonian itself should not change so that the equations of motion are exactly the same in the new coordinates as they were in the old coordinates right. So not only do I need the set of canonical transformations but I need a subset of this group of canonical transformations which leave the Hamiltonian itself unchanged in other words I should not change from H to K H must remain unchanged that does not always happen with all canonical transformations therefore 
the dynamical symmetry group of a Hamiltonian system for a Hamiltonian system the dynamical symmetry group is the subgroup of canonical transformations that leave H itself unchanged. So that not only do you go from a Hamiltonian flow to a Hamiltonian flow, but moreover it is the same Hamiltonian and then you are guaranteed that the dynamical equations do not change and therefore the space of solutions does not change either. In general therefore this dynamical symmetry group of a Hamiltonian system is a certain subgroup of sp to an r whatever be the number of degrees of freedom that also could be a group it may not exist you may not have much symmetry in the problem at all and that is in fact what happens in general but then in those cases where the Hamiltonian is integrable it turns out that you have a dynamical symmetry group and in fact that group is generated the infinitesimal generators of these transformations that belong to the dynamical symmetry group are related to the constants of motion f1 through fn. Yes, yes, of course, yes. In a group, every element has an inverse, so this is certainly true. Yeah. Canonical transformations have inverses, that was our first premise that going from the small q's and p's to the capital q's and p's was actually invertible. This was our premise that the canonical transformations we have talked about are global canonical transformations, namely, they apply in all of the phase space concerned. Of course, you could have a local canonical transformation which is not applicable in all of phase space. We have not looked at that possibility at all here. We are all only talking about global canonical transformations and they are certainly invertible. In fact, since you raise the point, a canonical transformation is a, symmet is a symplectic transformation. So, it satisfies this relation here and of course, what does this imply at once? Let us take this m across to the other side by applying the inverse operator so it immediately says m t j is equal to j m inverse and let us bring the j to this side by applying the inverse of j and therefore I get j inverse m transpose j is equal to m inverse but I know that j inverse is minus j j inverse is equal to j transpose is equal to minus j so in fact I know that m inverse is equal to minus j m transpose j for a symplectic matrix and therefore the inverse exists no reason why it should not this determinant we already saw was plus 1. So these transformations indeed form a group the point I am making is that the dynamical symmetry group could be much much smaller than this group than the group of canonical transformations could be much smaller in general because I also pointed out that in cases where the system is not integrable you do not have any symmetry at all but when you do have some special symmetry the system could become integrable this is the idea here. Let me for example go back to the two dimensional harmonic oscillator and ask what the symmetry group could be this is not easy to identify it is not a trivial task to identify the dynamical symmetry group of a system which we know to be integrable in general one has to do a little bit of work to do this. So let us look at the two dimensional oscillator which is h of q1 p1 q2 and p2 and this was p1 squared plus q1 squared over 2 plus p2 squared plus q2 squared over 2 if I took an oscillator which has exactly the same frequency in the 1 and 2 directions this is the isotropic oscillator here this Hamiltonian has a great deal of symmetry 
symmetry group the, the group of canonical transformations is the symplectic group in 2 degrees of freedom. So, this is sp 4 over the reals what is the group of transformations that leaves this Hamiltonian unchanged what would you say is a group of transformations that leaves this Hamiltonian itself unchanged notice that I can just take out the factor half and write this in this fashion. So, I should write here 2 d isotropic oscillator isotropic to mean that it is got exactly the same properties in all directions as you can see the potential energy is q 1 squared plus q 2 squared which is invariant under rotations in the q 1 q 2 plane. So, it has circular symmetry this kind what would you say is the symmetry or the group of transformations of these four variables each of which runs from minus infinity to infinity that leaves h unchanged we can switch variables, but there is a big huge continuous group of transformations what would leave this unchanged this combination unchanged. If I have x squared plus y squared plus z squared in 3 real variables x y z what group of transformations leaves this unchanged all rotations about the origin leave it unchanged in the 3 dimensions x y and z what leaves this unchanged all rotations in phase space in this 4 dimensional phase space all possible rotations about the origin would leave this unchanged what would that group be the symmetry group of a of h itself what would this group be it is the group of rotations in 4 dimensions 4 Euclidean dimensions what would that group be it is a group of 4 by 4 matrices but what sort of matrices would these be they have to be orthogonal what should the determinant of the matrix be plus 1 so volumes are left unchanged and that group is a group of orthogonal transformations in 4 variables called O4 but because the determinant is 1 you write an S here to write special or unimodular determinant plus 1. on the other hand this stands for orthogonal so on the one hand the group of canonical transformations in 2 degrees of freedom is sp4r the set of all 4 by 4 matrices with real elements which are symplectic which satisfy that condition on the other hand this particular hamiltonian is left unchanged by the group of all 4 by 4 matrices with real entries which are orthogonal and which have unit determinant it is clear that for the dynamical symmetry group of this problem the set of transformations in phase space that leaves this Hamiltonian unchanged and takes the Hamiltonian flow to a Hamiltonian flow does not change the Poisson bracket structure is that set of transformations which belongs to both this group as well as this group in other words the intersection of these two groups so all matrices which are both symplectic as well as belong to this so 4 that set of transformations that special subset of canonical transformations is in fact the symmetry group of the system. So as you can see it is not easy to identify the symmetry group of a dynamical system because not only must the transformation be canonical but it should also preserve the form of the Hamiltonian in this case since the Hamiltonian was so simple I could do this directly without too much trouble I could just identify it by inspection this looks like the surface of a sphere in 4 dimensions and therefore I could immediately write down SO4 now that is group which is the intersection of these two groups is a different group altogether it is smaller than either of these groups and it is the group of turns out to be the group of all 2 by 2 unitary matrices with determinant plus 1. So, let me not write that down in explicit terms and get into group theory, but let me just write the result down and say 
the intersection is SU2 which stands for the group of all 2 by 2 unitary matrices with determinant plus 1. So it is a set of transformations which can be put into 1 to 1 correspondence with this set of matrices here and this requires some mathematics to prove which we will not prove but I am going to simply assert that this is so. The reason I do so is because I would like to identify the generators of this group and show you what the physical meaning of these generators is. You see what are the constants of the motion here first of all we know it is integrable we had two constants of the motion which were in involution with each other and what were those two constants one of them was F1 which we could take to be just this the energy of the first oscillator and F2 was one half Q2 squared plus P2 squared. What else do you think is a constant of the motion here? It is clear the system is integrable and we know that the frequency ratio is unity in this case the same frequency for both these oscillators. So on the surface of this torus we talked about the last time when you go around the torus in this way once you also go around this way once exactly once. So the motion is periodic completely periodic there is just one period unit frequency these two are also in involution with each other. Now to describe the trajectory you need one more constant of the motion which is an isolating integral so that the trajectory does not wind itself around on this torus completely but rather is a discrete curve is a curve is isolated curve for each set of initial conditions. What else do you think is constant in this problem let us think a little physically q1 let us say is the x axis and q2 is the y axis and you have got a problem where you have an isotropic oscillator the same spring constant in both directions and the potential is circularly symmetric if I write this down in circular in plane polar coordinates this is just one half r squared. So what do you think is constant in such a motion well here is this particle in the q1 q2 plane well the actual shape of the trajectory will depend on initial conditions it will depend on what the phases are what the initial values of q1 and q2 are that is certainly true but what do you think uh, is a symmetry I mean what, what, what else is constant what sort of force if the particle is here and is attached by a spring to the center what kind of force is exerted by the spring in what direction is this force it is always radial therefore this is a central force problem it is certainly a central force problem what do you expect is constant in a central force problem the angular momentum that is right there is no torque on this particle the angular momentum is therefore a constant of the motion we guaranteed that now what is the angular momentum in this planar problem you just have two variables here is x and here is y and this is p sub x and that is p sub y what is the angular momentum well if you use this formula r cross p since you have reduced to a plane everything is in a plane this cross product is essentially a single number so what is r cross p there is only one component to it and what is that equal to uh, not p1 p2 q1 q2 what is think in three dimensions if you have r cross p in three dimensions what is the z component of r cross p. what is the third component of the angular momentum which I will call L or since I know that it is the third component if I am looking at a three dimensional problem let me just call it J3 what is this guy equal to yeah it is equal to Q1 P2 minus let me put a half here for a reason it will become clear in a second. I am guaranteed that this quantity is a constant of the motion in other words the Poisson bracket of J3 with H is 0 that is not hard to verify so indeed this is a constant of the motion and now it turns out that the following quantities J1, J2 and J3 which we have already written as Q1P2 minus Q2P1 
j1 is a quarter of q1 squared plus p1 squared minus q2 squared minus p2 squared and this is a half q1 q2 plus p1 p2 it turns out that each of these quantities is a constant of the motion. So indeed it turns out that j i j k on j sorry j i with the Hamiltonian is 0 i equal to 1 2 and 3. So we have other constants of the motion these two together with this third one the isolating integral actually specifies the trajectory completely the moment you put these three quantities equal to constant then in this four dimensional space you found the trajectory completely because the intersection the mutual intersection of surfaces on which this this and this are constant specifies a curve and that is indeed the phase trajectory for any given initial set. Pardon me j1 is a yes yes I am not saying they are independent I am going to come to the significance of the j's a little later but I am saying f1 f1 plus f2 is the Hamiltonian itself of course for integrability you just need two constants of the motion which are independent of each other and which are in involution they are represented for instance by f1 and f2 but I am actually finding a whole lot of other constants of the motion for describing the motion you actually need three isolating integrals in this problem and they are represented for example by f1 f2 and f3 and j3 but in addition these combinations are also constants of the motion sure this is just f1 minus f2 apart from some constant factor this is something else altogether and this quantity here is the angular momentum about the origin but now you cannot have more than two constants of the motion in involution with each other that is for sure. So in fact that is the maximum number that could be independent and in involution you can choose them as you please with various linear combinations I would like to choose this because this completely separates degree of freedom 1 from 2 altogether the others mix it up in some fashion or the other. Now the significance of this j1 j2 j3 is that they obey very interesting Poisson bracket relations and they obey the following relation among themselves you have j i j j is equal to epsilon i j k j k. this is the totally anti-symmetric symbol in three dimensions it is equal to plus 1 if i j k are a natural permutation or even permutation of 1 2 3 minus 1 if it is an odd permutation and 0 in all other cases this is the Levi Civita symbol in three dimensions. So this stands for a set of three relations j1 comma j2 is j3 j2 j3 is j1 and so on in cyclic permutation what does this remind you of this is exactly the relations obeyed by angular momentum components if you write r cross p in three dimensions and ask what is the Poisson bracket of lx with ly or ly with lz or lz with lx you get exactly this set of relations. So in some funny fashion angular momentum algebra in three dimensions is related to the dynamical symmetry group of the two dimensional isotropic oscillator and the reason is group theoretical it is purely algebraic it turns out that this group is generated by three combinations of q's and p's which are precisely these three quantities there if you like the generators of this group su2 so you see what is happening is to summarize things here is a system which is completely integrable it has two degrees of freedom so we have two constants of the motion in involution with each other which are functionally independent of each other and those are f1 and f2 since the motion is periodic rather than quasi periodic we need a third isolating integral another algebraic function of the q's and p's that is provided by this quantity j3 for instance which has the significance now 
of being the angular momentum about the origin. So, we have the energy of the first oscillator, the energy of the second oscillator and then the angular momentum about the origin. In addition there are these combinations J1 and J2 such that J1, J2 and J3 are all constants of the motion, but they are not in involution with each other they cannot be there are too many of them instead they obey a certain algebra. The Poisson bracket of any two is a linear combination of the same quantities in this case just the third one with the appropriate sign. That algebra represents something much deeper this algebra the existence of this this set of relations implies that there is a certain dynamical symmetry group in the problem which happens to be the intersection of the symplectic group sp4r of canonical transformations in this problem with the symmetry group of the Hamiltonian itself which happens to be SO4 and that group can be put into one to one correspondence the set of transformations with the group of 2 by 2 unitary matrices which is this group here and this group has 3 generators which happen to be the same as that of angular momentum in 3 dimensions and that is the reason why you have these combinations J1, J2, J3. So as you can see dynamics and the algebraic structure underlying integrable equations they are very closely linked with each other and this 2 dimensional oscillator gives us a simple model in which to understand the origin of these symmetries in this case. Of course if you go to 3 dimensions and write the oscillator down in 3 dimensions that is a much bigger group the symmetry group is much bigger the canonical transformations would be sp6, r and then you would have to look at the intersection of that or the subgroup of that which also leaves the Hamiltonian unchanged and that is a much more complicated group turns out that happens to be su3 in that case and so on. In fact the n dimensional isotropic oscillator has a symmetry group which is the same as a set of transformations the set of transformations that is a symmetry group is the same as the group of n by n unitary matrices with determinant plus 1 a very useful relationship in many applications. But I do not want to get into that right now I would like to go back and give you another problem which also you are familiar with where there is an extra symmetry we will see where this comes from. Yes if the generator is 3 it is exactly the angular momentum algebra so this thing here is no it will not be for example the 3D isotropic oscillator the dynamical symmetry group is SU n uh, SU 3. In fact the general statement is the n dimensional isotropic oscillator n dimensional isotropic oscillator I should not call it n because this number n has been used for degrees of freedom but well, okay it is the same number actually n dimensional is SU n. So, no it does not obey this algebra it obeys a more complicated algebra but the question you could ask is how many of these are there that is something we can directly answer how many do how many generators do you think there are in in SU n uh, well let us start from <laughs> we could start from 1 by 1 matrices and then we could go on to 2 by 2 3 by 2 3 etc. The least trivial case is uh, the, the simplest non trivial case is SU 2. So let us look at that we want to look at all unitary matrices 2 by 2 matrices which have unit determinant I want to look at the set of all these matrices and I permit complex entries ah, okay we will come back to what a generator is of a group since I have to tell you how these groups are generated what I mean by it is let us come back let us come back and tell you what a generator is a little bit I do not want to have a digression within a digression. So what is what is the what is the number of parameters that you need to specify a 2 by 2 matrix start with a 2 by 2 matrix with possibly complex entries we count the number of real parameters always 8 parameters because if the matrix is A B C D and A and B are all A B C D are complex numbers there is a real part and an imaginary part to these. So in general 8 real parameters are needed and now I start putting conditions on these matrices what is a unitary matrix a unitary matrix is one 
where u dagger u is equal to the identity matrix. So, this is unitary. The dagger stands for the complex conjugate transpose, the Hermitian conjugate of this matrix. So, I take the transpose and then do a complex conjugate of this matrix and I insist that this be true. So, what I am insisting upon is that A B C D multiplied by the complex conjugate transpose. So, this becomes C star, B star, A star and D star B equal to 1 0 0 1. I insist upon this. How many parameters are left now? How many conditions does this give me? Gives you 4 conditions. So, how many conditions are left? How many parameters are left? 4 parameters are left. I now insist that the determinant of the matrix be equal to plus 1, that is what makes it S. How many parameters are left? 3, and therefore, the number of generators is 3. In other words, any element of this group is found by taking certain special matrices, multiplying them by parameters, and exponentiating these matrices, and that gives me a finite element that is called a generator the group. So, there are 3 generators and that is exactly the number we found here 3 generators. I will illustrate what is meant by a generator in a minute, but now what do you think it is for S u n? What do you think it is going to be for n squared? It is n squared minus 1. Therefore, in 3 dimensions it is 9 minus 1 which is 8 generators and therefore, there are 8 constants of the motion which obey a certain algebra among themselves more complicated than this considerably more complicated than this, but that provides you with a symmetric group. Now, let us come to the question of what I mean by a generator and let us go back and do a little bit of elementary algebra here. So, I start with the simplest example of a rotation in two dimensions in a plane and let us write the equations down directly. So, I start with the x y plane and I make a rotation about an angle alpha to write new coordinates x prime and y prime and of course, I have x prime y prime is equal to a certain matrix acting on x y. This matrix here depends on the parameter alpha and it tells me x prime is a certain linear combination of x and y and y prime is a certain linear combination of x and y and it is well known of course, that we have it is let us call this matrix which represents rotation by an angle alpha let us call it r of alpha. Now, what are the properties of r of alpha? What does a rotation do? it keeps the origin unchanged, it is linear, it is homogeneous in other words 0 remains 0 the origin remains unchanged and distances do not change nor does this coordinate system become a left handed coordinate system what is right handed remains right handed. So, this means that this matrix R satisfies R transpose R equal to I it is orthogonal which keeps distances unchanged and the determinant of r equal to plus 1. Therefore, this r of alpha is an element of a group of matrices which are orthogonal 2 by 2 matrices with real entries in this case and with determinant plus 1. How many parameters are needed to specify a rotation? So, this is a one parameter group and there is one generator in three dimensions you have three Euler angles in general therefore, you have three generators for SO 3. In n dimensions Euclidean space how many generators do you need for specifying rotations? Uh, y n. Uh, there are n axes or n angles 
and this is precisely the point where I want to stop and we will take this up that answer is not right because that tells you something about the nature of rotations itself. Let me redefine a rotation, a rotation is a linear homogeneous transformation which keeps the origin unchanged for instance which is orthogonal distances are not changed and the determinant is plus 1. So a right handed system remains a right handed system. And the reason you say n is because you assume that every rotation is a transformation about some axis and there are n axis but this is not true because if I think of 4 dimensions then of course I could have a rotation which changes in the x y plane but leaves both the other 2 coordinates unchanged or if I look at 2 dimensions there is no third axis it is about a point so an axis need not be identified with the rotation. that is an accident of 3 dimensions it is an accident of odd dimensionality we will come to that. So the number of generators is the number of independent orthogonal planes you can find how many planes can you find in n dimensional space orthogonal planes like the x y y z etc n c 2 which is n times n minus 1 over 2 and that is the number of generators. So I will explain but this is a good example to explain what is meant by generators so some elementary group theory and then we will take it from this point. Okay. So let me write that down S O N I will explain what is meant by generator next time using this example. We'll take this one. 